<clears throat> hey guys, how are you? Let's see which is the best angle. Okay. How you doing, everyone? Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I think this is a good time, right? 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Perfect time for people in America. It's a Saturday, especially with COVID lockdown. <clears throat> I mean, some places are open as well as in Europe, right? So welcome. We'll wait a few more minutes for people to begin. And Lord willing, we'll go into the meat of the matter by the grace and mercy of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Honorable Father, Holy Spirit. Yahovah Father, Holy Spirit, Yahovah Father, Holy Spirit. Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Rapha, Yahovah Father, Holy Spirit. Yahovah Shalom, Yahovah Shalom, Yahovah Shalom, Father, Holy Spirit. Yahovah Nisi, Yahovah Nisi, Yahovah Nisi. Yahovah Yira, Yahovah Yira, Yahovah Yira, Father, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Father, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Father, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Father, we love you. Son of God, Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. We always want to begin by praising you, Father. Praising the Lord Jesus, your Son. Praising your Holy Spirit. Give us the grace to be in love with you. To perfectly trust in you and love you and cling to you. To perfectly trust in, love and cling to the Lord Jesus, your Son. To perfectly love. <clears throat> to be in love with. To trust in and cling to your Holy Spirit, Father. We need you. Not just to preach, not just to teach. We need you to live for you. We need you to delight the heart of Jesus, your son. We need you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, empower us by your spirit, sanctify us by your Holy Spirit, <clears throat> purify us, cleanse us by your spirit in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, and transform us to conform to the image of your son, our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Crucify our flesh, Father. Save us from our own sinful passions and the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the boastful pride of life. Crucify all of that in us. Mortify the fruits of our flesh and fill us with the fruit of the Holy Spirit, life from the Holy Spirit, passion from the Holy Spirit, love from the Holy Spirit, self-control, self-discipline from your Holy Spirit. And by your Spirit to become more like Jesus Christ, your Son. May he increase, may we decrease, Bobby. Please, Abba, please, Father. <clears throat> I ask that you bless this session, Father. Enable me by your spirit to recall every specific part of scripture perfectly. Perfect my ability to recall it and give me the power to live your word. Give us the power to live your word, to love your word, to proclaim your word, to understand your word for the glory of Jesus. And save me from error and stammering and confusion. And Father, please save me from being a crowd pleaser. Sanctify my motives in the blood of Jesus. Not to do it for the praise of men. Not to do it for fame or fortune. And not to be unnecessarily offensive, Father. Please, my God. Yahweh, Father, Holy Spirit. Yahweh, Father, Holy Spirit. Lord, give us the grace to know when to be bold as lions. When we need to rebuke someone and chasten a fool for his blasphemies. And when to hold back by the power of the Holy Spirit. Give us the grace to know when it's time to laugh and time to... To have fun and time to joke and time to be serious and time to be <clears throat> patient and and just be an ear to hear someone and not just to correct someone or or challenge someone. Please, Father, teach us how to glorify Jesus Christ in every sphere of our life, socially, politically, economically, martially, maritally religiously and spiritually, that in every field of our life, Jesus Christ will be glorified and magnified, Father, and guide our conversations. Save us from, from shaming you and grieving you or blaspheming your holy name. Save us, Father, for the glory of Jesus. Save us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Cleanse us in the blood of Jesus Christ and help us to be patient with each other for the sake of Jesus, Father. Bless them, Father. These are your children purchased by the blood of Jesus, born of your Holy Spirit. Bless them, Father. Convict them, Father. Convict me. Chasten us when we need to be chastened, but in your love and mercy. And give us the grace to be self-disciplined so we can walk in the Spirit and crucify the flesh, Father. And illuminate us to pour into the Scriptures, to plunge the depth of the Scriptures, bring out the meat of Scriptures, to feast on the Scriptures, your voice to us, Father. And to live according to your voice, the Scriptures that your Spirit produced through holy men of God. 
so that we can truly become like Jesus Christ, not just hearers but doers of your word. Please, Father, and destroy unrighteous anger, unholy indignation in us. Please, my God, and save us from attacks of Satan. Have your way, Bobby. Have your way, Abba. And please be with our loved ones. Those who are not saved, those who are saved, those in need, in my case, be with my daughters. Flood them. Flood those of our family members or our friends who need to be filled with your spirit, to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Flood them. Flood my daughters in your love and the blood of the Lamb and your living waters, Holy Spirit, and preserve them and preserve us for your glory. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Fill my lungs and my chest and throat with health, with the breath of life, and anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. Please, my God, please use these sessions, and please let my motive be to glorify Jesus in these sessions. Please, may I disappear and decrease. Please, Lord, help me not to make it about me, but about Jesus. Please, Lord. Please, Bobby. Please, Lord Jesus. Please, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name, now the Father, Holy Spirit. Yahweh Father, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name, Yahweh Father, Holy Spirit, please, my God, Yahweh, watch me, God, my Savior, King, Lord Jesus Christ, watch me, Lord God, my Savior, King, Lord Jesus. May the Father grant me clarity of thought and speech and remove on all filth and wickedness and flesh unholiness from me and from all of us in Jesus' name. All right. Yes, thank you, Tunda. All right. Yes, Lord willing, hopefully we'll have a blessed session. I pray the Lord will bring. People in droves who want to hear and not challenge and pontificate or argue, please help me to help you, brethren. Focus on the topic. Ask questions related to the topic. Don't let Satan distract you. Don't go into side issues so I can be a blessing to people and not cause people to stumble. Please help me to glorify Jesus and bless you for the glory of Jesus. Focus, focus, focus. When you hear someone bring up a point that you know it's not related to the topic, Control yourselves for the glory of Jesus. Focus so you can learn because the purpose of these sessions is for you to learn so you can know your faith and be convinced of it and live it out by the power of the Holy Spirit. So please help me to serve you for the sake of Jesus. Right? There are times in which we can go and socialize and have fun and banter back and forth. And there are some YouTube channels that allow it. David Wood allows it. Jonathan McGlatchy, these guys, they're okay with it. And they have the right to run their YouTube sessions the way they want. But for me, because I listen to you, when I say I listen to you, I'm, I'm reading what you're posting. So I'm listening to you so I can gauge whether I'm helping you or confusing you because I want the Spirit to use me to help you and bless you because my goal is I want you to be in love with Jesus and be like Jesus and glorify Jesus. And I pray that for myself in Jesus' name. So with that said, what I want to do is I want to tackle... This article by a Muslim. Let me get it. Sorry, guys. Sometimes my Mac freezes up on me. I pray the Lord will bless the connection. I pray it stays strong. Anna, what's up, my sister? Good to see you. Okay, guys, that's the article. Click on it. Save that article. Click on it. <laughs> Save the article. All right. Okay. That article is posted by Paul Williams. Let me give you the background. Paul Williams. Paul Williams used to be a Muslim. He's no longer a Muslim, but he's still an anti-Christian. What do I mean by anti-Christian? He still hates biblical Christianity. He still hates the evangelical faith, right? And so though he's no longer Muslim, he will still post uh, memes, articles, objections to the Christian faith, and still post positive stuff about Islam. Paul Williams left Islam because, again, it's not something personal. I'm not attacking him. He's an act, he's a struggling homosexual, right? He's a struggling homosexual who's been struggling with homosexuality. And so it seems like he's gone back to his homosexual lifestyle, which is why he left Islam, because he knows one thing, at least I give him credit. I give him respect. <clears throat> He will tell you up front, well, guys, if you click on the link, you'll see. When he keeps saying me, say who, guys, listen to me for the glory of Jesus Christ. Listen, click on the link, because these are the objections he posted against the Christian faith. Paul Williams at least has the temerity, the honesty, integrity to admit homosexuality is abnormal behavior, and it's an abomination according to the Bible and the Quran. Not so much the Quran, but that's what he believes. So he's honest. He's honest. 
He doesn't justify his homosexuality in order to maintain a religious commitment. At least I respect that in him. A homosexual who admits homosexuality is abnormal and it's condemned by the Holy Bible, the word of the true God, as well as in Islam. Now, but even though that's that's the case, and even though he's no longer a Muslim, he still posts memes, <clears throat> articles, objections to the Christian faith, and posts glaring, glaringly about Islam. So he has a deep-rooted hatred of the Christian faith because it's de demonic. He is demonized unless and until the Holy Spirit sets him free. So he just posted this, again, typical objections against the deed of Christ that you will hear. So I'm going to kill three birds with one stone by the grace of God. By the grace of God, I'm going to kill three birds with one stone. Number one, I'm going to respond to the objections. Number two, in responding to the objections, and I want you guys to focus. In responding to the objections, you're going to learn more about your faith. You're going to learn how to interpret the Bible more correctly by the power of the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit teaches us. So you're going to learn more about your faith. You're going to learn how to interpret Scripture in context, how not to interpret Scripture. And number three, you're going to then turn these arguments <clears throat> against Islam and Muslims. Why Islam Muslims? Because these are Muslim objections. So three, three birds with one stone. Number one, I'm going to respond to the objections. Number two, you're going to learn how to interpret the Bible by the grace of God's Spirit, the way it should be interpreted, how not to interpret it, and so doing, learn your faith and become stronger in your faith by the power of the Holy Spirit and more convinced you have the truth. And number three, you're going to turn these objections against Islam to expose Muhammad as a son of Satan and Antichrist. Okay? So these objections are a blessing in disguise. No, not really. Sentient 7 intrigue. Not so much Philippians 2, 5 to 11. See, again, I, when I said you're going to learn how to interpret the Bible and how not to interpret the Bible. As the Lord Jesus cleanses my throat so I can use my voice to glorify him. So those are the three birds that I plan to kill with one stone. The three main objections, objectives. Please, Holy Spirit, save me from <clears throat> error and confusion. Rebuke Satan in the almighty name of Jesus. Lord Jesus, cover us by your blood. Ooh, Satan hates us, right? Three main objectives, okay? Now, with that said, <clears throat> there are some things I do want to touch upon in light of the previous sessions because some people either did not understand me correctly because <clears throat> I either wasn't as clear as I should or could have been or they didn't want to understand me because they were scandalized by what I said. So let me make a point real quick. Gee, what a loser. Good job, buddy. All of a sudden, you decide to step out now. Could you be a bigger loser? You're the first loser and the last loser. But we still love you nonetheless. Okay. Yeah, what else? Thinking, loser, bitch. Yeah. Whew, these guys. I know, I know. You're, you're like Adam. You blame the woman that God gave you. All right. Now, let's focus. I wasn't paying attention to what you said on Discord because I choose to ignore you. No, it's okay, first last. I love to hate you and I hate to love you. Now let's focus. Let's focus here. Someone asked me if I was saying that John 3 verse 5 teaches water baptismal regeneration. This is why, guys, let me repeat. You need to make sure you've understood these sessions. Because one thing I don't want you to do is misunderstand me and then misrepresent me because that would be shameful and scandalous to do so, that you misrepresent someone due to your ignorance or misunderstanding. This is why, make sure you understand the points I make, and if that means you have to go back rewatch, do so until you understood what I was saying. So let me repeat John 3, verse 5 again. John 3, verse 5. What did I establish in that session? Let me repeat again, because a lot of people did not get it. And I hope I was clear. If not, the Lord forgive me for lack of clarity. Everything good is from the Holy Spirit. I said that being born of water and spirit in that context meant water baptism. I thought I was clear. I was also clear, I thought, that when I said water baptism, in that context, in that context, okay, 
It's referring to the water baptism of John the Baptist. John the Baptist water baptism. And what was that water baptism for? For repentance of sin. So let me repeat it real, quick, real quickly so I don't get misrepresented again. John's water baptism was a baptism for the repentance of sins. In that, by getting baptized by John, you were acknowledging, pay attention, so I'm not going to repeat this again. You're acknowledging and confessing that you're a sinner who needs to turn away from your sins and turn to God and trust God to save you. Okay? That's the water baptism that Jesus was exhorting Nicodemus to undergo. Let me repeat it again. That was the water baptism that Jesus commanded Nicodemus to undergo. But then I said clearly, if you paid attention, that water baptism did not give you the Holy Spirit for regeneration and new life. You guys remember I said that? Remember I said it. Go back and rewatch. I said when people got baptized at that time, either by Jesus or John the Baptist, they still did not receive the Holy Spirit for new life to be born again. Why? Because I was clear. John the Apostle wrote in John 7, 38 to 39. He said that the Holy Spirit would not be given during Jesus' earthly ministry until and after Jesus died, rose again, and would be glorified. It was only after his resurrection, subsequently his glorification, where he'd be exalted to heaven, that the Holy Spirit would then be given to all those who followed him and, and <clears throat> waited upon the promise of the Holy Spirit to be given to them. Was that clear for everyone? Was that clear? Okay. What does that mean? The water baptism that Jesus performed in John 3, John 3, 22, John 3, 26, John 4, verse 1 and 2, did not give you the gift of the Holy Spirit for new life regeneration. That water baptism did not give you the Holy Spirit for new life, for regeneration. Because the Holy Spirit would not be given until Jesus is glorified. What that did, that water baptism showed your realization that you're a sinner and your realization that you need Jesus to save you. So by coming to that realization and following Jesus, Jesus would keep you by his spirit until he would send the spirit to now make you alive and indwell you and seal you for salvation. Is that clear? Right? But then I said, here's the point I want you to catch because I'm going to play a clip now. I'm going to play a clip now. <clears throat> okay? I'm going to play a clip. But before I do, then I said, the early church, these great men and women of the faith, some of whom were disciples of the apostles, or the disciples of the disciples of the apostle. Like Irenaeus was a disciple of the great Christian martyr Polycarp. A holy man, a holy slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who I believe, guys correct me if I'm wrong. I'm going by memory. And I'm trusting the spirit to help me to recall these facts correctly. Please save me from error. Whom I believe was 86 years old when they burned him alive. Because he refused to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. If I recall, because I read it, but again, the church fathers are not like the books of the Bible. The books of the Bible you read or you hear over and over again. Not with the church fathers. The church fathers are different. Yeah. Yeah, Tony. There is something called the martyrdom of Polycarp. The martyrdom of Polycarp, which you can read free online, which is supposed to be based on eyewitnesses who saw him being burned. He was given the chance to deny Jesus Christ. And spare his life. And he refused. He said, how can I deny my Lord who's been nothing but good to me for all 86 years of my life? 86 years of my life. And so he willfully, boldly, fearlessly went to the flames and was burned alive because of his love for Jesus Christ. Now, why am I mentioning Polycarp? Irenaeus, who is the Bishop of Lyon's France, the bishop of the church in France was the disciple of Polycarp. 
Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. The Apostle John who wrote the Gospel of John, the letters of John in Revelation by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, knew Jesus, who was in love with Jesus, and Jesus was in love with him. So notice the pedigree. Irenaeus, Polycarp, John. Now, why am I mentioning them? I'm going to pay, play a clip to show you that the views of the early church fathers, the views of these great men and women of faith, either disciples of the apostles or the disciples of the disciples of the apostles, those whom God raised up, sealed by his spirit, and empowered to defend the true church and refute heretics and die for the truth, they believed, they believed, listen to this, John 3, verse 5, referred to Water baptismal regeneration. Guys, I need your attention. Don't let Satan distract you. From the second century on, any time and every time a church father quotes John chapter 3, verse 5, they always interpret it in reference to the baptism that the Lord Jesus sent out the apostles to carry out after Jesus went to heaven, that baptism in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit, and they believe that water baptism is what gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit and causes you to be born again. That's what they believe. So let me repeat. John 3, 5, in its context, is referring to John the Baptist's water baptism. That baptism did not give you the gift of the Holy Spirit because as long as Jesus was on earth, the Holy Spirit would not be given to people for new life. It's only after Jesus' resurrection that he breathes the Holy Spirit on the apostles only after his ascension that he pours out the Holy Spirit upon them to empower them. From that moment on, the Holy Spirit would be given. So the church fathers took from John 3, 5, that now after Jesus went to heaven and has poured out the Spirit, now when a believer gets baptized in water in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, then he is given the Holy Spirit at that moment. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit makes that person alive. And his sins are forgiven. KJ, KJ, if you're listening, I just said the church fathers said yes. Are you listening to what I'm saying? That's what they believe. This was the view of the church and it was the unanimous view. So in light of that, I hope you understood what I'm saying and what I'm not saying about John 3, 5. I hope you got it. Please don't misrepresent me. But now I'm going to play a clip. And here's a challenge for every one of us, even for me. And I'll tell you why it's a challenge for me. I'll explain it in a minute, but focus, please. Don't let Satan distract you because this is your church history. These are your, listen, whether you like it or not, you Protestants, all of us. These are our spiritual ancestors, our spiritual forebears, the men and women that God raised up to preserve the church, to defend the church and die for the church. They were not heretics. Okay. I'm not saying they're infallible, but neither are we. So we have to hear them out, study what they have to say, and seek the face of the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth to see when they are right and when they got it wrong. Because, again, not every father got everything right. Thank you. But now pay attention to this. Here's the challenge for all of us. And I'll explain to you why it's a challenge for me. Challenge for me. I'm going to play a clip from a dialogue, a discussion between James White and Jimmy Aiken on the Bible Answer Man when Hank Hennegraaff was an evangelical Christian. Are you guys ready for this? Are you ready? Here's the link. Let me get it for you. Give me a second because my computer's for some reason... Freezes up. Yeah, if you know, I don't know why it does that. Okay. Here it goes. Let me get you the link. Bible alone debate. Jimmy Aiken, James Aiken versus James White. Okay. Here's the link. We're going to start around the 25-minute mark. The 25-minute mark. Please, when I give you links, save them. Okay. Now, listen. Let me give you a story about Jimmy Aiken. Jimmy Aiken is a full-time apologist on staff for Catholic Answers International. He's one of their top apologists, and he's on staff with Catholic Answers International. Now, Jimmy Aiken used to be a Protestant who became a Roman Catholic. 
He had a discussion with James White on the Bible Answer Man when Hank Hanegraaff, Hank Hanegraaff was evangelical. Because a lot of you may not know, Hank Hanegraaff is now Eastern Orthodox. He and his family got chrismated and are now part of the Eastern Orthodox Church. And I know Anna is celebrating and rejoicing. And she's praying for me to join because she has a five-carat diamond for me when I do. Anyway, around the 26-minute mark, guys, I'm going to play it. Listen. Pay attention to what he says about John 3, verse 5. Around the 26-minute mark. I'm going to play it. Listen. I'm going to try to get it as loud as I can. Okay. Tell me if you can hear it. We can't interpret the Bible for ourselves. We can and we must. That's why God gives intellects. You know, this was something that Thomas Aquinas, with his big emphasis on natural law and the divine gift of the human Listen. intellect that separates us from animals and so forth, the rational soul that separates us from the sensitive souls that animals have, um, is, uh, is, is something that requires us to read and study God's word. What Trent is saying is that when the fathers unanimously so interpret a passage one way, that's when you can't go against it. So unless, if you have a case where every church father has said, this is, this is what this passage means, that's when you can't go against them. But if there's disagreement among the fathers, if there's not a unanimous consent, then you can go against it. And just to give an example of the passage where there is unanimous agreement among the fathers, I would point to John 3, 5. Every single early church father there is, from the second century on, said that when Jesus said you must be born of water and spirit, he was talking about baptism, water baptism, a, a unitary baptism involving both water and the spirit. Every single church father from the second century on said that. It, that uh, is something accepted by all Christians up until the time of the Reformation, at least all mainstream ones. You had Augustine saying that. You had Aquinas saying that, you had uh, John Wycliffe saying that, you had Martin Luther himself saying that. The first person to really deny that, as far as mainstream theologians would go, would be John Calvin. Everyone before him said that that is talking about baptism. And so that would be a passage where a Catholic would say, well, no, the Father's unanimous on this. I can't go against this. A couple of things, disagreement among the... Okay, did you hear what he said? <clears throat> I'm going to play it again. Did you hear what he just said? Okay, let me repeat it. I'm going to play it again. He said he searched the fathers from the second century all the way on up until John Calvin, and he could not find a single church father that denied that John chapter 3, verse 5 referred to water baptism regenerating you, water baptism being used by God to then give you the Holy Spirit to regenerate you and cause you to be born again. He said he could not find a single church writer, church father, <clears throat> that denied that's what John 35 meant. They all agreed that's what it meant. Even up until the time of John Calvin, even Martin Luther believed that. Did you hear what he said? They all believe this to a T. Okay, let me play it again. Very important for you to listen to this because here's a challenge for all of us. It's going to challenge me, and I'm going to explain to you why it challenges me. Well, let's hear it one more time, okay? Here's the link. Let's hear it one more time. So I'm trying to be as honest to God, to Scripture, to history as possible without being unnecessarily offensive or tickling ears. Johnny Torch and the church fathers can't agree with you, and they'd condemn you to hell and say you are a heretic. I'm just being honest. If you're living in the second century, you'd be thrown out of the church. Third century, fourth century, fifth century, sixth century, even Martin Luther would have thrown you out of the church. And that's the thing. You're not the church fathers. I'm not the church fathers, though they're not inspired or infallible, but neither are you inspired or infallible. To simply disagree with them either shows arrogance or you're stubborn and don't want to at least hear them out. I'm not saying they have to be right, but you're going to have to explain why did God allow all of them to believe that? You see the problem? Let me just play it and I'll explain it again. Let me play it. I'll explain why, Johnny. Just to say that, that's not that's not going to help you, Johnny. Honestly, and I say this as a brother who loves you. Exactly, Luisa. Not only you. Let's hear it one more time. Listen attentively, easily, and I'll bring out the implications, and we'll go into our topic. 
but please listen. And I'm not here trying to make you a Catholic, Orthodox, Assyrian Church of the East. If that's what you think, then you don't know me. I'm trying to make us, you and me, as honest to the, to the Bible, to the God of the Bible and history. Shut up, Muhammad. Even if that history goes against what we've been taught. Okay, now listen. Listen to this again. The fathers, if there's not a unanimous consent, then you can go against it. And just to give an example of the passage where there is unanimous agreement among the fathers, I would point to John 3, 5. Every single early church father there is from the second century on said that when Jesus said you must be born of water and spirit, he was talking about baptism, water baptism, a, a unitary baptism involving both water and the spirit. Every single church father from the second century on said that. It, that uh, is something that I have searched diligently, trying to find references to early church fathers who didn't say that, and I can't. There aren't any. Every single one I've checked says that, and that is a tradition that was accepted by all Christians up until the time of the Reformation, at least all mainstream ones. You had Augustine saying that. You had Aquinas saying that. You had... Uh, John Wycliffe saying that, you had Martin Luther himself saying that. The first person to really deny that, as far as mainstream theologians would go, would be John Calvin. Everyone before him said that that is talking about baptism. And so that would be a passage where a Catholic would say, well, no, the Father's are unanimous on this. I can't go against this. A couple things. Okay, that was around the 26-minute mark. Clip it and listen to it. So, guys, let me repeat again. Johnny, are you serious to use that example of the thief on the cross? I'm in a state of shock right now. Here's a guy nailed to the cross. He's about to die, and you expect him to be taken out of the cross to be baptized. Why are you looking to the exception as if this is the norm? as opposed to seeing that it's an exception, it's a special circumstance, that there's someone hanging on the cross. This is, and according to you, they should have said, hold on, wait, 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 wait. We got to take him off the cross, dip him in water, and put him back on the cross again, all right? Why? Why did you call me a thief? You know I don't have the patience. Okay, Johnny, I love you, bro. I love you, Johnny Torch. Okay, let me, let's come back to the issue. Okay, let me repeat the issue so we can go into the topic today. Bob is not Baptist, but I want to clarify it because I got a question and a comment and objection. Okay, let me tell you my tradition and why I say this is something we're all going to wrestle and struggle with that come from a similar tradition. I was raised among Baptists. Later on, I went back to evangelical church, and then I got exposed to five points of Calvinism, and a great influence was James White, who's Reformed Baptist. So my tradition has always been, listen to my tradition, credo-baptism, meaning you have to believe, confess, and turn to Christ before you can get baptized, and baptism is a symbol of your union with Christ. Water baptism doesn't give you the Holy Spirit, doesn't regenerate you. This is my tradition. This is what I've been taught. This is what I believe even up till now, but guess what? I then look at the church fathers and I realize I'm in trouble. Do you know why I'm in trouble? Because how do you explain from the second century, third century, fourth century, disciples of the disciples of the apostles? Irenaeus, disciple of Polycarp, a disciple of the apostle John who wrote John 3 verse 5. And everyone that comments on John 3 5, even Martin Luther, all believed unanimously John 3, 5 is about water baptism, and it's at water baptism, God gives you the Holy Spirit to be forgiven and be born again. So water baptism goes with spirit baptism. They go together. And this was the belief of Christians up until even the time of Martin Luther, and even today as we speak, not just Catholics, not just Orthodox, not just Assyrian Church of the East, Coptics, but even Lutherans. And I believe even Episcopalians. So Christians, if you're like me and you believe credo baptism like me and you believe like me, water baptism doesn't give you the Holy Spirit, but it's a sign and symbol that you're born of the Spirit and united to Christ. We got problems. 
We got issues that we need to wrestle with. We can't ignore because these men are not Joe Schmoes. Irenaeus is not a nobody. Irenaeus is not just a martyr of the church, a brilliant theologian of the church. He's the disciple of Polycarp, another martyr who is a disciple of the Apostle John. If you're going to tell me they got it wrong so early, then where was God to make sure the church didn't fall into such obviously, quote-unquote, false doctrine early on? Where is Christ to protect his church and guide his church to the correct interpretation of these passages? So it's not just saying, I don't agree with them. The implication of Christ involved in preserving his church and guiding his church in such a way that they don't fall into such false, damnable teaching, because if they did, then who was saved? And if none of them was saved, where was Christ to preserve his church? See, it's not just easy to ignore it. So here's my challenge to every one of you. Here's my challenge to every one of you. I want you to go to your favorite Protestant apologist, whoever it is, ask him the question, can you cite a single Christian for the first 16 Hundred years, with the exception of John Calvin, that represented the true faith, not heretics, that interpreted John 3, 5, other than water baptism, and deny water baptism was used by God to give you the spirit to cause you to be born again. Can you cite one? So here's my challenge to you guys. Go to your favorite Protestant apologist, be it Mike Winger, William Lane Craig, Frank Turek, James White. Ask them, Matt Slick, ask them, cite a father for the first 600 years, not John Calvin, he was the first, that said John 3, 5 is not about water baptism, and water baptism isn't used by God to cause you to be born again, to receive the Holy Spirit, and to forgive you. Cite one. Okay? That's what I'm going to leave you with. That's what I'm going to leave you with. Notice what I said my tradition is. I'm a credo Baptist. I believe that someone has to recognize Christ, believe and turn to him before he can get baptized. And water baptism is a sign and symbol of your union with Christ, not the act in which the Holy Spirit is given to you. And yet here I am faced with this evidence and I'm thinking, what do I do with this God? What do I do with this evidence that you've now put before me, confronting me that I can't ignore, that I'm wrestling and struggling with? Here we go. Original Desire. What about the thief on the cross? Oh, my goodness. Okay, Original Desire, let me use your logic. Here goes another guy with a with thief on the cross. Original Designer, let's think about it. Hmm. Let's think about it. Here's a guy nailed to the cross. He's about to die. So according to you, they should have said, hey, wait, wait, wait. Hey, Centurion, hold it. Take him off the cross, baptize him, and nail him back on the cross, stupid. I don't care he's about to die. I don't care that his case is exceptional. I don't care that he can't go to church and take communion like everyone else is supposed to. Hey, you better take him off the cross and dip him in water. Darn it. Are you guys serious? I mean, dude, aren't you even embarrassed to use him as an example? I mean, when people use <laughs> Right? What about the thief on the cross? Let me think. Hmm. He's got spikes in his hands and his feet. He's gasping for air. He's about to die. And you really expect, I mean, come on, dude, common sense. Bring him off the cross. Why? Don't you see he just confessed Jesus and he's got to get baptized in water now? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm, yeah. Uh -huh. Don't you know John 3 5? Stupid. I mean, come on, man. Okay. I mean, come on, man. Really? I mean, how do you, honestly, think for me. Guys, God has blessed you with intelligent minds sanctified by the Spirit. Honestly, I'm not making fun. The Holy Spirit has given you a mind to understand. Think about that example for yourself. How can this man get baptized? How can he take communion? How can he go to church and evangelize? All of which, as Christians, 
who are healthy enough and strong enough to do so are expected to do so if we love the Lord. When the guy's hanging on the cross, he's about to die. You expect him to do all of that? Hey, yo, you're probably not listening to what I said, so I'm going to ignore your comment because you're obviously not listening and you want to just preach your agenda, AO Israel. Now, with that said, let's go to the topic. Was that clear? I hope I clarified for the record, Luis and everyone else, we who hold to credo baptism, we got a lot of wrestling and struggling to do. Elgin, do you understand what I just said or no? You didn't understand what I said. Do you understand what I said, or do I need to repeat it and then school you on Acts? Because you went to Cornelius, but did you go to Acts 2.38? So I can turn the tables on you. In Acts 2.38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> right? So do you understand what I said? Pretend you understood my point. I'm going to test you to see if you understood my point. Do you understand what I said about the church fathers and their view of John 3, verse 5? No, no, no. Repeat it, though, Elgin. I want to see if you did. What did I say about the church fathers and their view of John 3, verse 5? They believe to a T, John 3, verse 5, is about water baptism. And then in that act of water baptism is where God gave the Holy Spirit to be born again. That's all I said. That's all my point was. That's how they understood John 3, verse 5. And if you're going to be honest to God, honest to Scripture, honest to church history— you can't deny that. So here's my challenge to every one of you. Here's my challenge to every one of you. Toby Jones is not listening either. I don't think you're going to last in this session either. Toby, let's pretend you're listening, but you got deleted anyway. Here's my challenge to every one of you. Here's my challenge to every one of you. Go to your favorite Protestant apologist, Matt Slick, Frank Turek, Mike Winger, wh whoever it is. Don't go to a Lutheran because he's going to say, yeah, you got to be baptized. Don't go to... Someone who does believe in water baptism or generation like Church of Christ, ask them, say, is it true that John 3 5 was interpreted unanimously from the second century, even up to the time of Martin Luther, to refer to water baptism being the means through which the Holy Spirit was given for regeneration? If you say no, can you cite one Christian, not a heretic, that denied that interpretation? Is everyone understood what my point was? So why are you giving me Acts 10? What does Acts 10 got to do with John 3, verse 5? Gee, you know, I'm going to block you for that, right? Because you just mentioned the thief on the cross that I just refuted twice because two other people before you made the stupid mistake of mentioning the thief on the cross, right? Yeah. Okay. What does Acts 10, 43 to 48, have to do with John 3, verse 5, its contextual meaning, and its understanding, interpretation by church history? Does everyone understand John 3, 5 is the focus of my discussion? Because I was asked a question about my session on what does it mean, water, spirit? And everyone understand that I'm talking about the church's unanimous interpretation of John 3, 5? Do I have to repeat it again? Right? Everyone there? If that made that point, don't ask me unrelated questions about Acts 10. I've dealt with Acts 10 in light of Acts 2.38. Remember what my tradition is. Here's my belief, my background. Let me repeat what my background is. I'm a credo Baptist, meaning I believe that someone must confess and turn to Christ and be baptized. And I believe baptism represents, symbolizes your union with Christ and that you've been born of the Spirit. But I'm also honest enough to tell you that my view is not the view of the church of the second century, the third century, and the fourth century, and the fifth century. It's not even the view of Martin Luther. Even Lutherans believe in water baptismal regeneration. Can I prove that to you? I'm going to give you another YouTube video. This is by Jordan Cooper. Jordan Cooper is a Lutheran. Jordan Cooper is not Roman Catholic, Orthodox, or Assyrian Church of the East. He's a Lutheran, and he did a two-part response to Brian Schwertley, proving, as far as he's concerned, that the Bible te teaches water baptismal regeneration, and he is Lutheran. He is not Catholic, Orthodox, 
or Syrian Church of the East. In other words, this is not uniquely a Catholic teaching. There are people who are not Catholic, not Orthodox, that believe it. And you'll find from the 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century, all the way till the time of Luther, this was the belief of the church. Not of heretics, but those that represented the true Orthodox historic faith. Here's the video. So you guys have a lot of wrestling to do. You guys had a lot of struggling to do. You guys have a lot of thinking to do, as I do, as I do. So that's all I'm going to say there. Are you with me there? That's all I'm going to say there. Here's the link. Dr. Jordan Cooper. You're going to see that Dr. Jordan Cooper will use the same passages that the early church used, that Catholics use, Orthodox use, Assyrian church uses, Coptics use. Same passages, but he's a Lutheran. He's a Protestant who follows Martin Luther. Okay, here you go. Here's the link again. So I hope I clarified what John 3 verse 5 means in its historical contextual context and how the church interpreted it from the second century onwards. So folks, if you're like me, we got a lot of wrestling, a lot of struggling, a lot of thinking to do. We can't simply ignore it. And, oh, well, that's, you know, that's their opinion. No, it's the opinion of holy men and women of God that God raised up and empowered by his spirit to defend the truth, to defend the true church, and to die for the true church. And they all agree in this regard. You can't just simply say, oh, these are your spiritual ancestors, the men and women that God used after the apostles to preserve the scriptures and his church. So we're just going to ignore them? All right. That's between you and God. Keep ignoring them. Okay. So uh, now that I've clarified, let's go into let's go into the objections against the deity of Christ. At least something more neutral that we can all agree. Ooh, man, the church fathers really hurt people. They hurt everyone. I O Israel. Why are you asking me about tongues, brother? A lot of snack bar. I like to eat a lot of snack at the snack bar. I like, like to eat a lot of snack at the snack bar. A lot of snack bar. I like to eat a lot of snacks at the lot of snack bar. A lot of snack bar. A lot of snack bar. Lot of snack bar. And I'm saying a lot at the snack bar. I didn't say a lot, but a lot of snacks at the snack bar. A lot of snacks at the snack bar. A lot of snack bar. You're, you're going to get stammered, all right, Mr. Truth. Keep changing the topic to embarrass yourself and Muhammad. Let's focus now. You guys ready? And when they say, take beer. You know when it says, take beer? You guys hear when they say, take beer? You know what you say when they say, take beer? Michelo. Take beer. Budweiser. Take beer. Heineken. Take beer, Corona. Take beer, tastes great. Take beer, less filling. All right, let's begin in Jesus' name. Here it is. Here's the article that we're going to be addressing. Hopefully we'll have a good crowd. May the Spirit bless for the glory of Christ. Focus now. Please, guys, now help me. Focus. We're now focusing on these objections against Christ from this Muslim blog. Even though he's no longer a Muslim, he's still pro-Islam. Help me to help you focus on the topic. Don't ask me questions on a related topic. In due course, in time, we'll be discussing water baptism. Do you know why? Because I plan, Lord willing, on doing a series on the Nicene Creed. Nicene Creed. And there is a statement in Nicene Creed where it says, I believe in one baptism for forgiveness of sins. God willing, we'll get there. If God gives me health and holiness, and if God preserves me for the glory of Jesus, and God provides for me, and you guys still want to come and listen to me and still benefit from me? Please, Father, in Jesus' name, bless the connection, rebuke the buffering. If you guys still want to come and listen and benefit from me, I will get into the Nicene Creed sooner than later. There's a lot of plans that I have for this YouTube channel, if God is pleased to use me for his glory. So let's begin. Here it is. Here's the article. Let's go to something more neutral that we can all agree and not beat each other into repentance because we disagree. Here are the objections. Does God increase in wisdom? Does God sleep? 
can Satan himself tempt God? So now who or what died on the cross? Who or what died on the cross? Which also begs the question, what did God really sacrifice? That's typical stupid objections by ignoramuses, a, false, a follower of an antichrist, the worshipers of a false god. Let's deal with the first objection. Click on the link. Go there. Click on the link. And you'll see there. Does God increase in wisdom? Objection number one. Here is proof Jesus is in God. Objection number one, or at least according to this blog. I know you've heard it, but this is going to teach you how to refute objections, how to interpret the Bible, what the Bible teaches about your faith, why you should believe what you believe, and how to turn it against the Muslims, okay? Let's see the passages that cite it. They quote 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. For if our God condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. See, God knows all things, 1 John 3, 20. Luke 2, 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Luke 2, 52, chapter 2, verse 52. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So here's the statement. We know that God does not increase in wisdom. God is all wise. So first objection. Luke 2, verse 52 says, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and between God and man. And yet 1 John 3, verse 20 teaches that God knows everything. Do you understand the objection? Patrick Rooney, I just gave you the link to the post. Brother, click on it, read it, and follow with me. Okay. Now, number one, here I want to teach you how to refute. No, Jay, my brother from a different mother, you're not. You're, you're like no other. Listen, don't help me to help you. Listen, trust me. If you listen, you're going to benefit. But if you tell me how to respond, you're going to end up embarrassing yourself. Okay. Here's how you interpret these objections. Anytime your opponent cites a book, he now gives you the authority to use that book or that author to refute them. What do I mean? Notice what he quoted. 1 John 3, verse 20. The moment he quotes any of the writings of John, he pretty much has given you the green light. He's now giving you the author authorization, authorization to use John to destroy his argument, to bury his prophet further in hell. Do you understand what he just did? See, I'm teaching you. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to fill me with wisdom, to glorify Christ, and sharpen me to sharpen you as we yield to the Holy Spirit. Please, Holy Spirit, perfect us for the glory of Christ and give me the health I need to glorify Christ. So notice number one. The moment he quotes a writer or an author, it's over for him. Wait, you just quoted 1 John 3, verse 20? Good. So now when I quote John to refute you and embarrass you, and prove Muhammad is the son of Satan, you can't object to John. By quoting him, you endorse him, and you authorize me to use him to refute you. Are you with me there? You understand what I'm doing right now before I move on? Okay. Now, why is that going to help you? You quoted 1 John 3.20, right? All right. Now, first last, are you back? Are you here? Or you're not back yet? Because I saw him here, but I don't know if you left. Okay, so you're back for good? Let's go to first, Let's go to the Gospel of John. Wait, you quoted John, right? End of story for you, buddy. Let's go to John. Now, pay attention. Read carefully. Follow with me. Help me to help you by the grace of God's Spirit. As we yield to the Spirit, the Spirit will show us how irrefutable our faith is, how solid the Bible, Bible is. Because the Bible is the voice of God, and it's the impenetrable rock that cannot be destroyed, but destroys and crushes everything that opposes it. New King James Version, John 16, 25 to 31. John 16, 25 to 31. Now let's learn our faith. Something that we all can agree and enjoy and be blessed and edify. Read with me. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language. See, I'm not going to speak figuratively, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. <clears throat> 
And that day you will ask in, in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and I believe that I came forth from God. Okay, now pay attention to 28. <clears throat> I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. His disciples said to him, see, now you're speaking plainly. Plainly, not figuratively. It's no longer parables. You're speaking plain, clear language. And because you're speaking plainly and you're using no figure of speech, now we are sure that you know all things. Bam! Before his death and resurrection, while on earth, Jesus Christ is said to know all things. Now we are sure that you know all things. And have no need that anyone should question you. By this we believe that you came forth from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? So notice, when Jesus starts, starts speaking plainly, not parables anymore, the disciples say, ah, now we understand you. Now we know you came from the Father out of heaven. So you existed in heaven before you came to the earth. And now we realize you know all things and do not need to be questioned in order to see whether you know what you're talking about. And Jesus says, oh, you finally believe, huh? It took a while, but you finally believe? Now let me explain what it means you need no one to question you. You either ask questions because you want to learn or you ask questions to test if someone knows what they're talking about. Oh, yeah? You think you're an expert on this subject? Well, how do you answer this? When he answers, like, wow, man, you really know your stuff. No need to ask you anymore. That's what they're saying. Yes, this is before his death and resurrection. What's there to be confused about? In John 16. It's right there. Right? So number one, did Jesus know all things before he died while he was on earth? Yes. Did Jesus continue to know all things after he rose again? Yes. Because in John 21, 17, three weeks after his resurrection, John 21, 17, but we're going to read John 21, verses 15 to 17. Three weeks after his resurrection, he appears to the disciples again. John 21, 15 to 17. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these, meaning the fish? Do you love me more than the fish and your trade? Because he's a fisherman. <clears throat> they were out fishing that, that morning. <clears throat> what does Simon say? Yes, Lord. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. In other words, what Peter is saying, why are you even bothering asking me? We already know that you know all things. You know all hearts. You know what's in our heart. You know if we love you or not. So why are you asking? You know all things. So wait, before his death, he knows all things. After his death, he knows all things. So Jesus wasn't asking because he didn't know. He was asking for a different reason. Making sense? And every one of you know why he's asking. Here is the compassionate, merciful, loving heart of Jesus. Peter denied him three times. So what did Jesus do? He didn't come to Peter and say, shame on you. Here I am alive in the flesh. What do you got to say for yourself? You denied me three times? What should I do to you now? No, that's not Jesus. You know how Jesus is? Instead of Peter saying, Jesus, son of God, do you still love me after betraying you? Notice the humbleness of our Lord. Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Notice what the Lord is saying. He's not, he's, it's not Peter asking him, Lord, do you still love me after I betrayed you? How could you still love me? I'm all, no, 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 no. That's not the art of Christ. It's the opposite. 
Jesus loves you to the end and forever. If Jesus is in love with you and you are his, he loves you forever. So he tells Simon, Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lamb. Simon, do you love me? The reason why he asked him three times is to make him confess and undo all the times he denied him. For every time you denied me, I will lovingly, gently restore you and use you again. I don't know this man. Simon, do you love me? Yes, I do. I swear I don't know this man. Simon, do you love me? Yes, I do. I'm telling you, I don't know this man. Simon, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. He restored him. But then he says something else. He says something else. Now that you say you love me, you're going to have to show me your love. Simon, here's what I expect from you. Here's what I demand of you. If you love me, if you love me, then you're going to love my church, feed my church, care for my church, and watch over my church. Because those who love me will keep my word. Those who love me, Father, please bless the connection in Jesus' name. Ya Alahi, please, Lord. I hate when it buffers. I'm not connected to the router or motor. Those who love me will keep my word. Those who love me will obey my command. So, Simon, you've now confessed your love. Show me your love in action. And no better way of showing me that you love me but by loving my church, caring for my church, <clears throat> watching over my church, teaching my church, and protecting my church from wolves, snakes, and scorpions. Okay? Everyone with me? Focus. Don't be distracted. Focus and don't be distracted. So the same John who wrote 1 John 3, verse 20. The same John who wrote 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. No, there's no difference, original. Don't try and impress yourself with the different words in Greek because you're going to end up embarrassing yourself. Do you know why, original designer? I'm sure you've been duped by preachers who tell you that Jesus says to Simon, do you agape me? And Simon says, yes, I phileo you. Do you agape me? Yes, I phileo you. And then the third time Jesus says, do you phileo me? Yes, I phileo you. See? Peter just phileo Jesus. Have you heard that stupid argument? Original? It seems by your question, you fell for that stupid argument. Tell me you've heard someone tell you that and deceive you. Were you deceived by that argument? Tell me so I can help you. Original designer. Folks, you're going to hear... A silly, stupid teaching that unfortunately I bought into because I was an ignoramus. But thank the Lord that when we seek his face, when we seek the Holy Spirit, he doesn't leave us ignorant anymore, but gives us the desires of our heart. And if we want to know him, he will make himself known and give us wisdom to know him and love him. Guys, you may not see it in the English. In the Greek, this is what you read. John 21, 15. Let me get you the link. Hold on. Okay. Okay. It's sad that people teach these things, but it's okay. Here, here. I fell for it too, guys, so don't, don't feel bad. Let me show you. So, again, we're going to take time with this. You want meat, right? You want me to go in-depth in meat and not rush through this? It'll be educational. Hopefully, it'll entertain you, but hopefully, it'll educate you and stretch you. Now, original, everyone else, there's the link. You click on it. If you go look, you don't even need to know the Greek. Just read the transliteration. It says, Simon, son of John, love you me, agapas me, agapas me. Then go and read what he says. It says, philo, si, philo, si, philo, olo la brig. No, philo, it's phileo, it's philo from phileo. Notice Peter didn't say agape. He said phileo. Peter, you agapas me, a philo, si. You see that? See, they'll tell you it's two different Greek words. Focus, guys. Two different Greek words. See, Peter doesn't agape Jesus. He only phileos Jesus. <laughs> oh, these arguments, man. Okay, but then the third time, Jesus changes the word. 
Because now Jesus says, Simon, do you phileus me? Phileus me, not agapes me. From phileo. You understand the argument? Jesus went from saying, Simon, do you agape me? And Peter said, no, I just phileo you. And then Jesus again said, Simon, do you agape me? No, I just phileo you. And then the third time says, okay, Simon, do you phileo me? And he got hurt. Yes, Lord, you know I phileo you, even though I don't agape you. Seriously? No, honestly, that's what the, I'm not exaggerating. I've heard sermons on this. David Banham, why would you be so stupid to ask me about the Aramaic when the only thing that you have is inspired Greek? So you're saying that the Holy Spirit misguided John because he didn't write it in Aramaic? For that, you need to be blocked and sent back to mommy. Get him out of here. Okay? For that sandwich. Okay? Sorry, I just said okay. Now, for the rest of you, let me tell you why that's a foolish argument. Just like English, even in Greek, words can be used synonymously. Agape and phileo can, depending on the context, have different nuances of meaning but also can overlap and be used synonymously. Are you with me there? Okay. Yes, there are places in which there may be a slight nuanced meaning to the use of phileo in contrast agape, but oftentimes they're used interchangeably so that agape will mean phileo, phileo will mean agape. You'll find that in many languages, okay? Here, I'll give you an example. I can say to Anna, I love you, or I can say, I adore you. And in Assyrian, if I say to Bratet Imshicha, see, they're different words, but they are synonymous. It's the context that will determine if they're synonymous. But if we're going to play that game, you know what you end up proving? You end up proving that in John 5.20, the father doesn't love Jesus. He merely likes Jesus. Do you know why? Because in John 5.20, Jesus says, The father phileo the son. John 5.20. For the father loves the son. Original designer. Do you know what the word love there is? When Jesus says the father loves the son, it's not agape. It's not agape. It comes from the word phileo. It's right there. He puts to the Greek, O God, pater, File, file, ton weon, ton weon, file, from phileo. Now, who would be that dumb to say, see, the father only likes Jesus a lot because he phileo the son, but he doesn't agape him. <laughs> Seriously? But can I tell you which retarded translation does translate it differently? The New World Translation in John 5.20. In John 5.20. The New World Translation actually translates phileo differently. It says the father is having affection for the son. Do you see it? John 5.20. For the father has affection for the son. Did you catch it? You see how they translated the word phileo? That's the New World Translation of Joe's Witnesses. The father has affection for the son because they too bought into this stupidity that if it's phile from phileo, then it has a different shade or nuance of meaning than agape. You, you got it, right? But in John 3.35, in John 17.24, we are told the father agape the son, and the father has been agaping the son from before the world was created. Who in their right mind would think, just because here it's phileo, that means the father doesn't have agape love for the son, and that his love is not intense and infinite and perfect. Okay? So anyone who tells you in John 21, 15 to 17, that there Jesus said, Simon, do you agape me? Nah, Lord, I just phileo you. Oh, okay. Simon! But do you agape me? No, nah, Lord, I just phileo you. All right, Simon. I'll settle for phileo. 
Do you phileo me? Yes, Lord, I phileo. All right. I'll have to settle for phileo. Really? Does anyone think for a moment that's the meaning of John 21, 15 to 17? Jesus is settling for less than agape. Do you agape me? No, I phileo you. But do you agape me? No, I phileo you. All right, I'll settle for phileo. All right, Jesus, now we got a deal. Right. It's like me saying to someone, a girl, do you love me? No, nah, I just like you. Come on, sweetie, do you love me? No, I like you. All right. But do you like me enough to go out with me and have some ice cream? Yeah, I like you enough. Okay, remember, you can only get married on this side of eternity. <laughs> okay, we're good. All right. All right. You understand it's silly, right? So what are you trying to say, Anna? You phileo me, but you don't agape me, Anna? All right. All right, but anyway, do we answer that objection? Gee, Diana, you would know, huh? All right. Everyone else, do you understand? Don't make a big deal over the fact that in the Greek, the words are not the same. Understand, like any language, you can use two different words synonymously. You can say perfect, you can say complete. You can say love, you can say adore. And it means the same thing. How do you know when it means the same thing? Context. How do you know when it may not be mean the same thing? Context. I'll give you an example of context here. Do you love me? No, I don't. I like you, but I don't love you. See, right there I can see like doesn't mean love. You get my point? Context will determine... What the words mean. Obviously, Peter's not going to say to Jesus, Lord, I don't know if I agape you. You know, I'm having some doubts whether I can agape you. But will you settle for phileo? After all, I denied you three times. And now you've been raised from the dead, immortal, deathless. And now I know you're God in the flesh. But all I can give you is phileo. Could you settle for that? Yeah. Oh, oh. Uh-oh. Now, definitely, if I use phileo for David Wood, if I use phileo for David Wood, you know it ain't agape because that man makes it impossible for anyway, anyone to agape him. So, David, I phileo you. Yes, David, I phileo you. Yes, I phileo you, David, because there's no way I can agape a white supremacist like you. Anyway, with that said... Can we regroup? Exactly. I don't agape that white supremacist. In fact, David, I chick fillet you. Yes, chick fillet. Yes, I chick fillet you. Because that's all I'm going to take you is to chick fillet and buy you a 50 cent. Well, they ain't got nothing for 50 cent. Okay, with that said, everyone. Let's regroup by the grace of God. Haterwood is here learning sound theology so he can steal my material, package it, and make millions while I struggle and panhandle. But that's okay. I'll carry him and bust my back carrying him until the Lord calls me home. Yep, refill. 50 cent refill. With everyone else, you understand what we just did? The gentleman quotes 1 John chapter 3, verse 20. The gentleman quotes 1 John chapter 3. This buffering God. I hate it. Guys, usually the buffering doesn't cause problems, and it's been doing wonderful, but for some reason it buffered right now, but in Jesus' name. Anyway, now, learn this principle. Learn this principle. The moment someone quotes an author to refute your faith, that's it. You've got them. Understand this principle, guys, please. I want you to learn this. Make it second nature. To glorify Jesus Christ, okay? If he quotes John, that's it. Game over. You're going to quote for John? Well, let me tell you what John shows. No, 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 no. John is not reliable. Wait, hold on. Who quoted John? You did. So if John is good enough to prove your point, John is good enough to then refute you and decimate your religion and show that Muhammad is a son of Satan. So number one, did we establish from the same John who wrote 1 John, 
that in the gospel of John, Jesus knows everything while he was on earth, before his death, and even after his resurrection. Did we establish that? In John 16, 25 to 31, and John 21, 17, Jesus, before his resurrection, after his resurrection, knows all things, and it's not hyperbole. How do we know it's not hyperbole? Because in John 16, 25 to 31, it said, I'm speaking plainly, not figuratively. Plain language. And the disciples say, ah, now that you're speaking plain language, not figuratively, now we get it. You know everything, and you came from the Father, from heaven, into the earth, not figuratively, not hyperbolic, hyperbolically, but literally. Not hyperbolically. Literally, you know everything. That's why we don't need to question and test you anymore. And you did come from the Father, from heaven, into the world. Right? So that was John. But wait, he quoted Luke as well. We're going to have a field day with this objection. He quoted Luke as well. I'm going to do a multi-part series on this blog. Save the blog. Save the arguments, lest he removes it. Lord Jesus willing, we're going to systematically decimate it. And in so doing, you're going to learn your faith, learn how to interpret the Bible, how not to interpret it. Be strengthened in your faith that you have the true God and Christ is God in the flesh. The Bible is his word. And turn it against these anti-Trinitarians. Okay? Now, he went to Luke 2.52. Hmm, you mean the same Luke that says the following in Luke 10.22? Remember, once he quotes an author, he's stuck with that author. Let's go to Luke. 10.22. He quoted Luke 2.52. Let's go to Luke 10.22. Now read with me, folks. Guys, please help me to help you learn. Grow with me by the power of the Holy Spirit so we can know our faith, be assured of our faith, love our faith, love the God of our faith and his word for the glory of Jesus. Luke 10.22. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the Father is except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. One more time, Luke 10, 22. Mods, you have my permission. If there's any satanic distractions, people not behaving, you can send them on their merry way. Read with me, Luke 10, 22. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows who the Son is except the Father, and who the father's father is except the son and the one to whom the son wills to reveal him. Talk about me. Even liberal critical, critical scholars, liberal critical scholars say this is an astonishing assertion that sounds like the gospel of John. Right? They call it a Johan, Johan, Johanine, 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 Johanine. Ugh, say that five times fast. Yohanin or Yohanai or Johanin or Johanin, thunderbolt. Yep, thunderbolt. Okay. Okay, why is this astonishing? Folks, number one, notice what our Lord is saying about the Father. No one knows the Father. Why? Why doesn't anyone know the Father? Because the Father is incomprehensible. That's what they call it. Like a thunderbolt from John's gospel found in Matthew and Luke. Yep, a zap. No one knows the Father. Why? Because the Father is incomprehensible and omniscient. It is not possible for a creature to know the Father <clears throat> infinitely and comprehensively. That's why it says no one knows the Father, because the Father is beyond comprehension. But he says something astonishing, except the Son. But notice the first part of it. Pay attention to the first part of it. It gets even better. No one knows who the Son is except the Father. Likewise, no one knows who the Father is except the Son. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, Lord, I understand no one knows who the Father is because he's an infinite mind. He's, un, uh, he's omniscient. He's incomprehensible by nature. So a creature cannot know God comprehensively and infinitely. But you said in the same way no one knows the Son. Are you claiming to be incomprehensible and omniscient like the Father is? That's number one. Number two, you then say, though no one knows the Father, you know him, and no one knows you except the Father. So are you saying that because you're incomprehensible, 
Only the Father can know you truly and completely and exhaustively because it requires an omniscient mind to know you. Implication, you two are beyond comprehension. But then you say you know the Father the same way the Father knows you. But Lord, hold on. The Father knows you inside and out, knows you completely, comprehensively, knows every thought of yours. Are you saying you know the Father the same way he knows you? You know the Father to the same extent that the Father knows you? So that the Father who's incomprehensible, omniscient, but you know him inside and out? And only the Father can know you truly because like the Father, you too are incomprehensible, omniscient. That's what you're implying in this saying? Did you get it? Did you get it? Before I move on? Notice how he states it. No one knows who the Son is except the Father. Why? Why only the Father can know you? And no one knows who the Father is except the Son. How is it you can know the Father to the same extent the Father knows you? And we understand why no one can know the Father because he's beyond comprehension. So are you saying, likewise, no one can, you, can know you because you too are beyond comprehension, which is why only God the Father can know you because he has an omniscient mind to know that which is incomprehensible and beyond the ability of any creature to know? But then you know the Father to the same extent that he knows you? Is that making sense? Is it sinking in? Exactly, Alex. Luke 10.22 goes hand in hand perfectly with Proverbs 30, verse 3 and 4. Proverbs 30, verse 3 and 4. The holy ones that are beyond Agur's ability to fully, completely know and comprehend. Did everyone get the implication of Luke 10.22 before I move on? Did everyone get the implication of Luke 10.22 before I move on? Abu, I know your Muhammad was a filthy whore, a scum dog, scum of Satan, filthy whore of Satan who whored people like your mother, treat them like whores and prostitutes. For you insulting the Holy Spirit, Muhammad is beneath the feet of Jesus because he's a scum whore, bastard of the devil. That's what you get for mocking the Holy Spirit. But now let me humiliate your filthy dog Muhammad even worse. Let me show you the Holy Spirit because K can't be patient. K Soko, she's putting a weapon in the hands of Muslims by bringing up a question not related to my topic about the Holy Spirit. So K Soko, because she's not patient, I now have to address that because a scum like you just insult the Holy Spirit because of your bastard dog, Muhammad, who's worse than a dog. No, it's not related, K. It's not. I'm dealing with the objections of, of Paul Williams. Can you show me where Paul Williams brings up the Holy Spirit and the objections, Kay? Go ahead. Because you just allowed a Mohammedan to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, Kay. Okay. Go to the link. Show me where, show me where Paul Williams brings up the Holy Spirit. Kay, if you so notice what you did, Kay, you know I'm going to block you, sister. I'm going to have to block you. I'm sorry. Go to the blog. Show me where in the blog Paul Williams brings up the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the, j typical. Take off like a coward. Bye, Sam. I love you, Sam, and take off. Do a hit and run. All right? Guys, the reason why I insulted this guy, because he mocked the Holy Spirit. Did you catch it? He mocked the Holy Spirit. Go back, and he just insulted the Holy Spirit. Mocked the Holy Spirit. That's why his prophet is a dog, scum. Filthy dog, the dog of Satan and burning in hell. Keep mocking the Holy Spirit. Watch what I do to your prophet. Okay, but now, since Kay couldn't be patient, she couldn't be patient and had to bring up a question not related to the topic that even piqued the curiosity of Anna. Let me show you where the Holy Spirit is in Luke 10, 21. Luke 10, 21. Luke 10, 21. Okay. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit. Do you see the Trinity there? In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and revealed them to babes. 
Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. Do you understand that if you just learn context, K, in verse 21, you see the Holy Spirit in union with the Son, so the Son is not referring to the Spirit or excluding the Spirit because He's the eternal companion of the Spirit who works in union with the Spirit. Luke 10, 21. Do you guys see it? One more time. Luke 10, 21. Right there, if we simply learn how to read context. But see, we Christians are one verse Charlie. Let's just look at Luke 10, 10, 22, because there wasn't 21 verses that came before it. Wait, what about the verse immediately following, preceding, not following, immediately preceding 22? He rejoiced in the Spirit. There you have it. Father, Son, Spirit working together. The Son never works apart from the Spirit, and the Son's statement does not include the Spirit in not knowing. He's talking about no creature knows that the Holy Spirit is not a creature. The Holy Spirit is the eternal Spirit of the Father, the eternal companion of the Son, who always works with the Son, whom the Son is always working in union with. Cheryl, poor Cheryl doesn't know my long history with Kay. Cheryl, I know you have a good heart. You love this sister. Kay is a sister. But her and I have a long history, especially on Discord. This is not the first class her and I have had. But she's a sister in the Lord. God bless her nonetheless. But it's the patience part. Now, Anna and everyone else, did you understand? If you just read 21, there is the Holy Spirit. There is the Holy Spirit in union with the Son and the Father. He's right there. In the verse immediately preceding verse 22, do you guys see it? Right? So why would I address the issue of the Holy Spirit when that's not the objections in the blog? I'm making it clear. Let me deal with the objections. Don't imagine objections and bring them up. So I have to now go on a tangent and deal with an issue that though important, not related to this specific Mohammedan blog, that I'm responding to. Everyone with me? So let's refocus by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ. Let's refocus. Do you understand Luke 10, 22? The same gospel of Luke. The same gospel of Luke depicts Jesus as the omniscient, incomprehensible son. Did we get that? depicts Jesus as the omniscient, incomprehensible Son, who alone knows the Father comprehensively to the same extent that the Father knows Him. And only the Father can know the Son, because like the Father, He's beyond the ability of a creature to fully comprehend. Notice, I said creature, but the Holy Spirit is not a creature. The Holy Spirit is the eternal companion and Spirit of the Son, and works with the Son. That's why in verse 21, you see the Son rejoicing in union with the Holy Spirit. There you have the Trinity. Do you caught it there? I want you to focus. Since he quoted Luke, he stuck with Luke. Remember, once someone quotes an author, say you're stuck with him. If he's good enough to prove your point, he's good enough to refute you. Now, let me show you what Luke says about Jesus, and I'll come back and explain Luke 2, 52 in a minute. Uh, no, you're not going to agree to disagree and walk away because I'm going to nail you, and you're going to have to refute me. No, 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 no. You're not running away. Why do you disagree? In fact, call me on Skype to see how far you get with your disagreement. Don't be a tough guy on a computer screen saying you disagree when you can't def defend your position. Why do you disagree? See, look at these snakes. They think they're going to go with it. Oh, I agree, disagree. Show me where I'm wrong exegetically. These guys think they're going to come here and do a hit and run and get away with it. Where am I wrong exegetically? Time to school someone, son. Esprit de corps. Where am I wrong exegetically? You're not going to run. You're going to prove your eisegesis and perversion of scripture, or I'm going to have to school you. Exegetically means to interpret correctly and bring out the correct meaning. Uh, trestle. Exegetically means to bring out the correct meaning by interpreting it correctly. 
No, you can't disagree. You're going to tell me why you disagree. Or I'm going to have to then put you in your place. No, that's not I disagree. Why do you disagree? Come on. Make my day. I disagree. Sam, I just, I can't, can't I just disagree? No, because people like you are dangerous because you put a weapon in the hands of the enemy to pervert scripture. No, you're not going to disagree and simply shut up. What's your disagreement? Either call me or air your disagreement so I can school you, son. Scoot over, son. Let daddy show you how it's done. So is it a figure of speech when it says that the son has to reveal the father to men? So now let me embarrass you. Is it a figure, figure, of, figure of speech when he says the son has to reveal the father to men for men to know the father truly? Is that a figure of speech? You little coward. That's why you take off. Right? Stupid. Guys, don't let people just simply say, I disagree. Damn. I have a right. Don't you know? I have a right. You know, Fifth Amendment, you know, freedom of speech and assembly. Don't hurt my feelings. I just disagree. I don't know why I disagree. I can't exegete scripture if my life depended on it. I'm just, I'm just worse than David Wood. David Wood couldn't exegete either. All right. For the rest of you who are serious, you understand Luke 10, 22? There is no disagreement. It's not simp simply a figure of speech. It is emphasizing the fact you cannot know the Father truly apart from the Son. You cannot know the Father truly and intimately apart from the Son. What's figurative about it? And the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So that's a figure of speech, Sam. Doesn't mean you can only know the Father from the revelation of the Son. Stupid. You can know God apart from the Son. Yeah. Renee is going to have a field day today. Renee, I know you're going to have a field day with all these images of making me look ugly and stupid as possible. With my coffee-stained teeth, Renee. If you keep taking pictures of my coffee-stained teeth, I'm going to stay single for a long time, Renee. Hadouken. For the rest of you, you with me so far? Are you excited? Are you animated? You following with me? Everyone with me? So Luke 10, 22, everyone got it? Everyone understood Luke 10, 22 shows that Jesus is the omniscient, omniscient, incomprehensible son who's like the father in omniscience and incomprehensibility, right? Okay, now let's go on into Luke to see what else we can learn from Luke. Okay, let's also see what Luke has to say to confirm that Jesus is the omniscient Son of God who became flesh. Let's go to Acts 1. Let's go to Acts 1. I disagree. I disagree. So what? You'd be a bully. Bully? Okay. okay, let's go to Acts 1, verses 1 and 2. Acts 1, verses 1 and 2. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, number one, regroup and focus by the grace of God. Notice Jesus chose the apostles. Read verse 2 again. Until the day in which he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Did you catch it here? Jesus chose the apostles. Let's not focus on Islam. Let's focus on Jesus. Did you guys catch it? Acts 1-2. Jesus chose the apostles. The apostles whom he had chosen, right? Everyone there? Don't let the agents of Satan distract you, please. Focus. Okay. Go ahead, do what you want. Post it in every Muslim room. Okay, now, let's go to Acts 1-6. Go to Acts 1-6. Focus, Jesus chose the apostles. Who do they call Lord? 
Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, this is Jesus before he ascends to heaven. They asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So notice Jesus chose the apostles. They call him Lord right before he ascends into heaven. Acts 1, 21. Acts 1, 21. Pay attention here. Therefore, of these men who have accomplished us, who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. So pay attention. Jesus is the Lord, the Lord Jesus. He is the one who chose the apostles. Jesus is the Lord that they address as Lord who chose the apostles, right? You got to get this. Guys, try to text less. Pay attention more so you can follow. Okay? Okay? So if you follow that, he is the one who chose the apostles, Acts 1, 2. He is the Lord of the apostles, Acts 1, 6 and 21. Notice now, as they pray to ask, which of the two that they had set apart would replace Judas? Would it be Matthias or Joseph? So now they're praying, asking that heaven would reveal, does Matthias or Joseph replace Judas? Notice in Acts 1.24. Let's see if you catch it and connect the dots. Learn how to interpret in context. Acts 1.24. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, Show which of these two you have chosen. You, O oh Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen. Who is the Lord that they're praying to, to reveal to them which of the two, Matthias or Joseph, has he chosen to replace Judas, one of the 12 apostles he originally chose? Did you catch it before I move on? Debo, we got it the first 10 times you mentioned it. Just be patient and listen. Acts 1, 2, the apostles were chosen by Jesus. Acts 1, 6, and 7, he is the Lord of the apostles. That's why they call him Lord, Lord Jesus. So now as they're praying for the replacement of Judas, Lord, you chose the 12. Which of these two do you now choose to replace Judas? They're praying to Jesus in heaven, confessing him to be Lord in heaven, who knows the hearts of all. Is it sinking in before I move on? Acts 1. Now let's put it back to back in case you're not getting it. Acts 1. We're going to do it back to back. So follow the pattern. Learning to interpret in context. Acts 1, verse 2. Verse 6, verse 21, verse 24. Acts 1, verse 2, verse 6, verse 21, verse 24. Read it and tell me that's not Jesus. Until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, one of whom was Judas. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, you, Lord Jesus, before you go to heaven, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? 21, therefore of these men who have accompanied, accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus, Lord, who is Jesus, went in and out among us. 24, and they prayed and said, you, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen. Not only do they pray to Jesus, who's in heaven, not only do they say Jesus is Lord, they acknowledge he knows the hearts of all. Who's not getting it? So he's omniscient. He is the Lord in heaven who knows the hearts of everyone. Omniscient. But I thought he grew in wisdom and stature. I thought Jesus doesn't know everything according to Luke. Giant everyone else, are you making sense? Is it sinking in? You're getting it? That in the context, you cannot avoid that the Lord whom they're praying to, that is in heaven, must be Jesus because the context has prepared you for this prayer. Jesus is their Lord who chose the apostles. 
And now they're seeking their Lord, who's in heaven, to choose the replacement for one of the apostles, Judas, who killed himself. And in praying to him, they call him Lord and say he knows the hearts of all. And in case you don't see it's Jesus, let's go back to Luke 5 and read 20 to 26. Luke 5, 20 to 26. You're learning a lot of how to interpret scripture and the Christology of Luke. When he, Jesus, saw their faith, when they brought the paralyzed man, pay attention. When he saw their faith, he said to him, man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Oh, so Jesus on earth knew the hearts of men. How much more in heaven? Notice Jesus saying, Why are you reasoning such in your hearts? So Jesus on earth knew the hearts of men. How much more in heaven will he know the hearts of men? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you? Or to say, rise up and walk, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been <clears throat> what he'd been lying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. So folks, make the connection. On earth, he knew the hearts of men, what they're thinking in their hearts. In heaven, he knows the hearts of men. On earth, he can do what only God does, forgive sins, heal diseases, and knows the hearts of everyone. Why would you then think that somehow in heaven, he doesn't know, shut up, Momo, he doesn't know the hearts of men? Did everyone catch it? To further prove to you that they are praying to Jesus, I want you to get this. To further prove to you, they're praying to Jesus, to Jesus, more proof. You want more proof? They're praying to Jesus. Let's go to Acts 7, 59 and 60. Acts 7, 59 and 60. I hope these sessions are blessing you. This is part one of a series of refuting this blog. Acts 7, 59 and 60. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Oh, wow. Stephen, the first Jewish Christian martyr, filled with the Holy Spirit as he's being stoned and he's about to die. Before he dies, he looks to heaven and says to Jesus, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And Lord, do not hold this sin against them of them killing me. Stephen, a Jew, prays to Jesus. Stephen, a Jew, prays to Jesus the way the Old Testament saints pray to Jehovah. Let's put Acts 7, 59 back to back with Psalm 31, verse 5. Acts 7, 59 with Psalm 31, verse 5, back to back. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Notice what the psalmist says. Psalm 31, verse 5. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Stephen, you're a Jew filled with the Holy Spirit, mighty in the Old Testament. You know that as a Jew, you cry out to God at the moment of death and entrust your spirit to God. Yes, I know that. Why is it that you're about to die and the one you call in heaven is Jesus and you entrust your spirit to Jesus Right about the time you're about to die and enter the next world. Why are you praying to Jesus the way the Old Testament saints pray to Jehovah? But it's going to get a little better. Acts 7, 59 with Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Acts 7, 59 with Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7. Okay. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. 
So common sense. If God gave me my spirit, then when I die, my spirit will go to him who gave it to me. But if Jesus isn't God, why, Stephen, are you surrendering your spirit to Jesus when your spirit will return to the God who gave you your spirit in the first place? Before I move on, sinking in? Thank you, Philip. Everything good comes from the Holy Spirit. So worship and love and praise the Holy Spirit for raising up sinners like me with my issues. And pray the Holy Spirit keeps me in love with Jesus. You got it, I.O. Israel. You got it. Wait, so what did that Mohammedan do? He quoted Luke. You mean the same Luke who testifies that Jesus is omniscient, incomprehensible? The same Luke who says that Jesus knows the hearts of everyone? The same Luke who shows Jews, Jews who knew the Old Testament, praying to Jesus while he's in heaven, worshiping Jesus while he's in heaven, praying to Jesus as their Lord, and ascribing to him the very worship and activities that the Old Testament attributes to Jehovah God in the Old Testament? Is that what you just read? Oh, but it gets more amazing. It gets more amazing, folks. You ready to get more blown away? Glory to God. We had a good crowd today. We had over 230. Praise you, Lord. May they keep coming who are sincere and attentive and not argumentative, who are know-it-alls, when their arrogance want to pontificate. Have mercy on them and have mercy on me, Lord Jesus, for your glory. Oh, it gets better. You want to, you want to get really blown away? Stephen prays to Jesus the way Jesus prayed to the Father while Jesus is on earth. Are you ready to show you that? Jesus is worshipped and prayed to by the first Jewish Christian martyr, the same way Jesus cries out to his father when Jesus was dying. Okay, get ready now. Luke 23, 34 and 46. Luke 23, 34 and 46 with Acts 7, 59 to 60. Thank you, Ross. God bless you. Luke 23, 34 and 46 with Acts 7, 59 to 60. You got it, Smokey, right here. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. Compare it with Stephen. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, I'm really baffled. I know the Father is God. So I'm not surprised that Jesus on earth says to the Father, forgive those who are crucifying me. They don't know. And Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Why then, after Jesus enters heaven, after his physical bodily resurrection, where he now dwells in a physical body of flesh and bone, indestructible, immortal, and deathless, and he's in heaven. Why now that he's in heaven, the followers on earth are now praying to Jesus, the way Jesus prayed to the Father, if Jesus is not equal to the Father in essence and glory and power and majesty. Tell me understand. So now let's go back. Let's go back to Acts 124. Acts 124. One more time. Acts 124. And they prayed and said, Oh, you, O oh Lord, you who know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen. So, how can Jesus know the hearts of everyone, even while he was on earth? Luke 5, 20 26. If he's not omniscient, and how can he be omniscient if he's not God? So it's Luke contradicting himself. He said, Jesus grew, but Jesus knows all things, knows all hearts. No contradiction, because Luke is like us. He knows Jesus is the God-man. As God, he knows everything. But as a true human being, born as a human baby, like all humans, he grew. While at the same time, as God, he remained the same. Because Luke believes in the two-natured Christ. This one eternal divine person who became human, he's the God-man. 
Welcome to the wonderful world of the Trinity. Yep, Catholic, exactly. That's another good point. Sinking in? Thinking in? David Young, I know. You're getting excited to introduce us to HANDS, which is the acronym, acronym that Rob Bowman and J. Ed Kawasaki came up with, which was the outline of their book, Putting Jesus in Their Place. Just be patient, David. Stay young. Stay young at heart. Be patient. And just help me to help you and just follow along. Everyone got it? Sinking in? You see what a nightmare this Mohammedan's appeal to 1 John and Luke turned out to be for him and Muhammad? What a nightmare it turned out to be for the stupid mistake of quoting Luke 2.52 and 1 John 3.20, thinking it actually refutes us, whereas it actually buries Muhammad and exposes Islam as being a religion from Satan. Before I move on, I want it to sink in. Everyone with me there? Did it sink in what you just learned? Let me see. According to Luke, is Jesus omniscient incomprehensible? According to Luke, is Jesus the Lord in heaven who's prayed to and worshiped the same way the Father is prayed to and worshiped? According to Luke, is Jesus the Lord in heaven who receives the spirits of his saints when they die? <clears throat> Does Luke affirm all of that? Is that what we learned from Luke? So why would someone be that stupid to quote Luke 2.52, Luke 2.52, to try to prove Jesus is just a man, not God, and ignore all that Luke wrote in Luke and Acts? And this is just the beginning. We're going to unpack Luke and Acts and John to destroy this objection. But i just giving you a moment for this to sink in, for you to swallow it in, take it in whole, Understand, because number one, if you don't understand these arguments, you can't share them. And if you can't share them, you can't glorify Christ and refute attacks against his deity. You have to understand these arguments and trust the Holy Spirit to enable you to understand them until it becomes second nature. And when it's second nature, share them, proclaim them, destroy and demolish every argument and blasphemy against the true God so that you can leave them with no excuse. For their blasphemy, so they must repent or suffer the judgment of God and strengthen your brothers and sisters in Christ like you're being strengthened right now. And notice as you're being strengthened, as you're learning, you're standing more in awe of the Bible and the God of the Bible and falling more in love with him. That's the reaction you want from all your brothers and sisters in Christ. So can you learn this material? Because I'm not the only one. God has called a church. All of you born of the Spirit belong to the body of Christ. And all of you are the church militant, warriors, male and female warriors, mighty in the Spirit to destroy the kingdom of Satan, demolish objections and blasphemies, take captive every heart for the glory of Jesus and strengthen your brethren that Satan does not snatch them from your midst for the glory of Jesus. Right? Right? With that said, let me give you one final example. Lord willing, we'll do part two. But before I end it, is Magdalene here? Magdalene here, she went to sleep. And Medina, yes, he says to hate your prophet who's a filthy dog, scum of the devil, who's buried in hell because he's a dog who whored and prostituted women like your mother. Shame on your prophet. May he burn in hell forever by the power of Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, final one. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the final example from Luke that Jesus is God in the flesh? It's okay, brother. Take notes, and guys, you have my permission. Rewatch the sessions, make clips of the sessions, upload the sessions to your YouTube channels, like Psalm 23. God bless the brother. He uploads all my sessions. Subscribe, help him go viral for the glory of Christ. And when I give you links to articles, you have my permission, print them, upload them to your channels, as long as you don't sell them and charge, okay? 
Now, are you ready for the final one for tonight? God bless you, Carolina. Lord bless you all. Jesus bless every one of you. Are you ready? Pray God keeps making us bold, fearless, holy, pure, in love with Jesus, and not be afraid of death, but to laugh at death because Christ has conquered and make us bold as lions for the glory of Jesus. Okay, final one. You ready now? Final one. And Lord willing, we're going to do part two tomorrow. It's Father's Day tomorrow. What better way to celebrate Father's Day than to gather together and praise and glorify our Heavenly Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, with the family of God. We, the children of God, the brothers and sisters of Christ, born of the same Spirit, coming together to praise our Father and thank our eldest brother Jesus for making us children to his Father by pouring out the Holy Spirit upon us. Okay, now, final one. And then we're going to do part two tomorrow. Focus, guys. Come on. I'm, I'm excited for you. Like, I'm on fire for you guys. You guys got me excited. Oh, right. All right. Now, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the apostles. You guys now got to walk with me. I'm going to have to walk you through the exegesis of Acts 2. Are you ready? I'm going to walk you through the exegesis of Acts 2. In Acts 2, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the apostles. Acts 2, verses 1 to 4. Acts 2, verses 1 to 4. A lot of meat, and I'm going to end it with Acts 2. A lot of meat, guys. When? Thank you, Daniel. God bless you, my brother. I wish I can be like Athanasius. I pray I'm holy the way Athanasius was, filled with love, joy, and peace of the Lord Jesus Christ like Athanasius, bold like him and willing to die for Jesus like Athanasius, who's my hero after Paul. Acts 2, verses 1 to 4. Read with me. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Okay, now watch. And suddenly there came a sound. So they heard an audible sound. They heard a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house. So they heard like wind rushing at them. They heard a sound. The whole house were, was filled where they were sitting. Now watch here what they saw. They heard and saw something, three and four. They heard and saw something. Then there appeared to them. They saw what looked like divided tongues. They saw multiple tongues resting on top of the head of every one of them. Tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them utterance number one notice the holy spirit appeared visibly here the holy spirit appeared visibly as tongues of fire and he appeared as multiple tongues of fire pay attention that's what you're reading he appeared as multiple tongues of fire confirming that the holy spirit who's god and as god he's shapeless bodiless being God, he can assume multiple shapes and forms simultaneously the world over. You catching that? That's the first point I want you to see. They saw on each one of them a tongue of fire. That was the Holy Spirit appearing visibly to signify to them, Jesus has kept his promise. Jesus, your Lord, is alive in heaven, and he's now sent me to fill you. Never doubt when your Lord sends something, he will do it. Because he's the truth and he's alive and cannot lie. You understand what this means? Jesus told them, stay in Jerusalem until I send you the Holy Spirit. When he showed up, you know what that meant? Let it sink in. Holy Spirit, penetrate their hearts with what I'm about to say. That was a sign. The Holy Spirit saying, look, you can trust Jesus because he's alive. He's not dead. He's alive in heaven. You can trust that if he says something, he'll do it. He's alive. Christians, he's alive. He's not dead. And he's the God of truth. He will do everything he's promised. Here I am showing you you can trust him. Okay? That's number one. Number two. The third point I want you to get. Notice when the Holy Spirit filled them, they were speaking in multiple languages and dialects. That tells you the Holy Spirit is omniscient because the Holy Spirit knows every language 
and can cause you to speak any and every language perfectly because he's the creator of all languages. That's the third point I want you to get. That's the third point I want you to get. Okay? And then if you read from 5 to 13, let's read 5 to 13. I'm going to take some time on this, 5 to 13. Yeah. Let's take some time unpacking this. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. You guys got to pay attention now. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together. You understand? They heard the sound of people speaking, right? So they came. What's going on? And they found the followers of Jesus, okay? And were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. I'm going to unpack this. Guys, if you... There's a time you need to pay attention. You got to pay attention now. I'm going to unpack this, okay? Everyone heard them in their own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? We know their dialect. They speak the Galilean dialect. And how is it that we hear each one in our own language in which we were born? How is it that though he's Galilean, I hear him speaking my dialect? You hear him speaking your dialect. You hear him speaking your dialect. What's going on here? We can't deny it because we're seeing and hearing it. Now watch here. Notice all the dialects they spoke. Parthians and Medes and Elamites from Persia. Those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Iraq, Turkey, Judea and Cappadocia. That's Africa, Pontus and Asia. That's Turkey, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues. The wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? Others mocking said they are full of new wine. Now I'm going to have them post 13 one more time. I'm going to have them post 13 one more time because this is crucial. This is crucial. And you Christians who believe in communion of saints, get ready. You Christians who believe in communion of saints, I'm going to give you another weapon in your asserno to prove it's biblical. Are you ready? I'm going to kill several birds with one stone. Notice in 13 it says they mocked them because they thought they were full of new wine. They were drunk. Folks, I used to drink, unfortunately, before I was a Christian. You know how a drunk man sounds. He doesn't sound coherent. He sounds like he's slurring. Right? Have you ever been around a drunk man? Before I was a Christian, I used to get drunk, unfortunately, to my shame. A drunk man doesn't sound coherent. He's not like, bleh, 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 bleh. you know why some of them heard them sound like they were drunk? Here's the miracle. If you read it carefully, pay attention. The miracle was that for some, the Holy Spirit allowed them to hear Peter speak in their dialect. In other words, you know what the miracle was? It isn't Peter speaking multiple dialects at the same time. It's the Holy Spirit allowing that person to understand Peter speaking his dialect, whereas the Holy Spirit allowed this person to understand Peter speaking in his dialect. But for those whom the Holy Spirit didn't give that gift, they sounded like they were speaking gibberish. Much like you hear people today who speak in tongues, you don't understand? It sounds gibberish. Definitely, Smokey, that's what it is. You understand what you're hearing? Two groups of people. Two groups of people. One who by the grace of God's spirit, look at this guy, Razzle. Razzle, all this and what you took away is drinking is not a sin, but as long as you're drunk, did you get convicted because you like to drink some Hennessy? We're talking about the spirit and you're talking about, hey, drinking is not a sin. Only a Chaldean could talk. <laughs> anyway, focus. Two groups of people. One group that wasn't given the grace of, of the Holy Spirit to understand what the apostles were saying in their dialect. So all they sounded like they were slurring like a drunk man. <laughs> another group, another group, pay attention. Another group who by the Holy Spirit heard them speaking in his or her dialect. So the miracle isn't that Peter spoke multiple dialects. The miracle is whatever Peter said, the Holy Spirit translated it in the dialect of that person whom he had grace to hear the gospel.
You with me there? Now, how is this a weapon in the hands of those who believe in communion of saints? Someone in heaven doesn't have to know all the languages of the earth. All is required is the Holy Spirit takes a person's petition and make it understandable to the language of the person in heaven. So you can speak in Russian, and the Holy Spirit then communicates your words to that person in heaven in the language he understands. That's the miracle. So it's a canard when someone says, well, how can someone in heaven understand all these languages? Who told you he has to understand all these languages? The Holy Spirit, the creator of all languages, who not only knows all languages, understands all languages perfectly, but created all languages, can take that language and make your language understandable in the language of the inhabitant of heaven and vice versa. You with me there? Told you there's a lot of meat. I'm almost done, but there's a lot of meat. You with me so, so far? Before I move on? So far, you with me? Now, what does this say about the Holy Spirit who is able not only to have a person speak in the language of the individual he's communicating to, but has the ability to make multiple people hear this person speak in all their dialects at the same time? What ability must the Holy Spirit have to do that for these individuals? And what ability must the Holy Spirit have to fill a group of Jesus' followers and empower them miraculously to glorify Christ? If that doesn't show you that the Holy Spirit is omniscient, omnipotent, I don't know what will. I don't know what will. So right here, you got proof of the deity of the Holy Spirit. Yes, most likely, Smokey, they did. Right? And that's why the Holy Spirit didn't give them that grace because they knew they were at a point they were too hardened to accept the revelation. Everyone with me so far? But how is it tying with Jesus being God? How is it tying with Jesus being God? Are you ready now for the icing on the cake? Glory to God, we had a good group today. We had over 230. Thank you, Lord. Keep bringing them for your glory. Keep giving us meat, Lord. Keep giving us wisdom, Lord, to know you, to fall in love with you, to be in awe of you. Keep our hearts aflame with passion from your spirit. Because we don't love you enough. We need to love you more. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Okay, are you ready? Are you ready? How does this prove Jesus is God? Okay, now notice what you said. You said some of the Jews were drunk because some of them were simply hearing another language they didn't know. But then why is it that it says that the disciples spoke in all the languages represented at at Pentecost, how come their language wasn't represented and they didn't understand in their language, Ariel? Because you see the list? Jews from under heaven were gathered, and every Jew from every place understood them in their dialect. You mean their dialects wasn't represented, Ariel? Good question, but you see how to refute that? Where were they from, Mars or Venus? Man, they must have been from some planet, right, Ariel? Maybe they were UFOs visiting. Because remember, UFOs have been here from the beginning. After all, they helped build the pyramids. Don't forget the area. But anyway, so we got Jews from, from Mars or Venus. But no, good question. Now, everyone, follow with me. Everyone else, follow with me. Because he's asking, because Ariel is anticipating objections because he wants to be ready to refute them. Right? But don't forget, Ariel. It says in Acts 2, 5 down, Jews from all under heaven were there. Parthians, right, from Crete and from Cappadocia. Obviously, they were Galileans. Notice it says Galileans. How could they have known all those languages under the sun where all these Jews live? That's Acts 2, verses 5 to 13. Now, follow with me. Here's how you're going to know Jesus is God. Here's how you're going to know Jesus is God. You ready? Come on, man. Let's go out with a bang. I'm excited because I got to go walk. And hike that mountain. Hopefully I don't die of a heart attack or a snake bite. All right. How does Peter explain this miracle? Acts 2, Acts 2, 14 to 21. How does he explain this miracle? Acts 2, 14 to 21.
Thank you, Anna. Let me repeat what you just said, this miracle. This happened at Mount Athos with the late Saint Paisios. He spoke just Greek, and he would have long discussions with German Protestants. Him in Greek and them in German, they would leave in awe and joy. Amen. Because the Holy Spirit is alive. He's alive, Anna. He's alive. He's almighty. And he's the creator of heaven and earth. And he's with the church till Jesus returns and forever. So that's why. So glory to God. These miracles happen because Jesus is real. Let's read Acts 2, 14 to 21. But Peter, standing up with the 11, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. It's nine in the morning, dude. They're not alcoholics. They're not like Razzle, who's an alcoholic, a slush that gets up in the morning and hits vodka and Hennessy. Right? Nine in the morning, that's his breakfast. Now watch. Keep reading. It's third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. He quotes Joel the prophet. Now, please pay attention to the prophecy. If you don't pay attention to the prophecy, you're not going to connect it with Jesus. You won't see how Peter identified Jesus as God. You won't see it if you don't listen to the prophecy. Here's the prophecy of Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. God says this. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit. I, God, will pour out of my spirit. I'm doing it, not someone else in heaven. I, God in heaven, will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Now pay attention now. Pay attention. 18 to 21. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The, sh the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Now pay attention to 21. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Two things I want you to notice from this. Peter says what you're hearing and seeing is fulfilling Joel. The prophet Joel says the day will come. God in heaven will pour out his spirit. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Peter says he's fulfilled it. He's poured out his spirit on us. So now call on him and be saved. Now, folks, let's bring out the implication. Are you ready? You want meat, right? It's been kind of long, but you want meat, right? Number one, notice that God fulfilled the prophecy of Joel by pouring out his spirit, not on the Pharisees and their disciples, not on the Sadducees and their disciples, not on John the Baptist and his disciples. He poured out a spirit only on the followers of Jesus, a Jesus whom just 50 days earlier was crucified and buried. Now, the question that the Jews had to ask is, if Jesus was a fake Messiah, a blasphemer whom we killed and got rid of, why is it God is honoring his disciples, pouring out the spirit on them and no other Jew? What's going on here? And so Peter uses the miracle to show, you know what? Because Jesus isn't a fake. And guess what? He's not dead. He's alive. God raised him back to life and he's in heaven. Acts 2, 22 to 24. And I'm not going to read all of it, but Acts 2, 22 to 24. Verses 20 to 24. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know. You know he did miracles. You saw those miracles. You can't deny them, though you accuse him of being a sorcerer. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands have crucified, you have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. Now they're confronted and stumped. You know why they're confronted and stumped? Number one, they know by now the tomb of Jesus was discovered empty. His body is gone. So there's no body. Number two, they're seeing the disciples of this Jesus 
whom 50 days earlier they had killed, is now filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in their language miraculously, which they're hearing and seeing and they can't deny. And now they're confronted with a miracle. Hold on, wait. They're speaking in my dialect. You're hearing them in your dialect. He's, so we see the miracle. This is not natural. This can't be something human in origin. This is something miraculous. But it's the disciples of the crucified Jesus that are speaking in our dialects. And then Peter's telling us that's because God has poured out his spirit on them, the followers of Jesus. Why would God do that and honor the followers of Jesus if Jesus was a fake Messiah who's dead and buried? Could it be the case that God did raise Jesus and vindicated him and he's in heaven and he's not dead? If so, guys, we're in trouble. We killed our Messiah. We're in trouble. Now it gets better. Remember what the prophecy said. Remember what the prophecy said, because we're almost done. The prophecy said, God will pour out his Holy Spirit, not someone else in heaven. God in heaven will pour out the Spirit, not some creature. And number two, the prophecy said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So you need to call on the name of the Lord God to be saved. And God will pour out his spirit. Get ready to be blown away. Are you ready now? Because now we're going to close, close the session and seal the deal. Are you ready? Remember what the prophecy said. I, God, will pour out my spirit. And the prophecy said you must call on the name of Jehovah, the Lord, to be saved, not a creature. Ah, but watch what happens. Acts 2, 32 to 33. Acts 2. 32 to 33. This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. Watch where he went. 33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, he was exalted to the right hand of God in heaven, having received from the Father, the Father gave him what? The Holy Spirit. He, Jesus, poured out this which you now see and hear. Wait, 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 wait. Peter, the prophecy of Joel says, God pours out the Holy Spirit from heaven. But you just said that when Jesus went to heaven, it wasn't the Father who poured out the Holy Spirit. It's Jesus who took the Spirit from the Father, and Jesus poured out the Spirit on his followers. So are you now saying that the God of Joel is the Father and the Son? That the Father and the Son are God? So that the Son receives the Spirit from the Father and the Son pours out the Spirit because the Son is the God of Joel, one with the Father? Is that what you're saying? Because Joel said, God will pour out the Spirit. You're saying, Jesus poured out the Spirit. But then you're saying, He poured it out from the Father. So that means the Father is God. But then Jesus pours out the Spirit, which Joel says God will do. So Jesus is the God in heaven who pours out the Spirit from the Father, who also must be God, but there's only one God. Oh, but hold on. Do me a favor so we can end it. First and the last, post Acts 2, 21, with Acts 2, 37 to 38. Acts 2, 21, but Acts 2, 37 to 38. There's no articles now for this one. Truth, I'll give you some articles tomorrow, God willing. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what the prophecy said. It shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what the prophecy said. But now read Acts 2, 37, 38. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. But wait, Peter, the prophecy you cited said you must call on the name of Jehovah. But now you said you must turn and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Peter, you have now really turned my world upside down. Upside down. You're a Jew and I'm a Jew. The prophecy of Joel says, Jehovah God will give us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we need to call on the name of Jehovah God. But you just said we need to turn and embrace and believe in the name of Jesus Christ so that we can be given the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that Jesus poured out from heaven, from the Father. What are you trying to tell us, Peter? That the God of Israel is not just the Father? That Jesus, the man whom 50 days earlier we had killed, that too is the God of Israel who became flesh? Yes, that's what I'm telling you. Jesus of Nazareth, the Jew whom 50 days earlier we saw beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, nailed on the cross, and died and buried. You're telling us that's Jehovah God? The God of Israel in the flesh, but at the same time, he's not the Father? He's not the Father in heaven? He's the Father's Son who's with the Father on the throne, pouring out the Spirit? And his name we have to call on to be saved. That's exactly what I'm telling you. Jesus of Nazareth is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Moses. The God of Isaiah. The God of Joel who became flesh. The flesh he took from the holy, consecrated, pure womb of his virgin mother, Mary, by the Holy Spirit, without any man touching her sexually. That flesh he took from the virgin. That flesh he's now glorified. That flesh he's made deathless. He's now in that flesh. And that is the flesh of the God of Abraham, who is now known as Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Our God has come Israel, and he's the man Christ Jesus. Will you turn to him and acknowledge him and worship him with the Father? Did you catch it? Aren't you thankful for this Muslim for being so stupid, for posting an article attacking the deity of Jesus and quoting these books? Because now God took what Satan intended for evil. Satan, the father of Muhammad, used this man to bring great harm. But God took the evil of Satan and is now using it to bring great glory to Jesus through the servants that God has raised up filled with the Spirit to worship and glorify and love Jesus even unto death? Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful? Our God lives, and our God is the Father, His eternal Son, His eternal Spirit, the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Yahovah, Elohim, the God of our fathers, the God who's in love with us, and may we be in love with Him, and the Bible is His Word. And his Bible is alive and active. And when you read it, you hear his voice, the voice of the great shepherd. And maybe may we be in love with that voice, enslaved to that voice, and cling to the voice and love him more and more. We love you, Father. We love you, Son of God, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Bless us and save us from our own flesh, sinfulness, from Satan and the world. And bless our loved ones, my daughters. Cover them, cover us in the blood of Jesus. Seal us, seal us by the Spirit. Give us the health we need to serve you and the holiness to delight your heart. We love you, Bobby. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Holy Spirit. Maranatha, may the Lord Jesus return sooner than later, and may we be sealed in his love, covered by his blood, and filled with the Spirit, so that we're not naked and ashamed when he comes, but we will rejoice in him and cause him to rejoice when he meets us face to face, and we behold the God-man in his glorified physical body and kiss his physical hands and kiss his physical feet and bow before his feet and tell him, Lord Jesus, we love you and we are in love with you. Do not allow us to depart from you. In Jesus' name, Father, says we love you. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Lord willing, I'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow, I may have to do a session at, let me see. It's going to be between 7, 7.30 Eastern Standard Time because Al Fadi is doing a live stream at 3. So look for me around the same time, 7, 7.30 Eastern Standard Time. 
Though it's Father's Day and I won't have my daughters, can you pray for them? Pray for them because this is now the second Father's Day that they haven't been with me and I haven't been with them. Can you ask the Lord Jesus, the God of infinite love and mercy, who loves them, to do a miracle and bring them to me and keep them where I'm at so I can raise them to love Jesus by breaking their mother to fear him and repent of her sin? Because until she does, I won't see them. But Lord willing, I'll still be here tomorrow, God willing, celebrating with you because we are sons and daughters of a heavenly father who is almighty to save, who is in love with us. And we are his children because of our eldest brother, Jesus, who purchased us by his blood to become adopted children of his father, born of his spirit. We love you, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus, our oldest brother, and we love you, Holy Spirit. Keep us in love with the Father and Son and with you forever in Jesus' name. Lord willing, see you tomorrow. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus.